Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for singing that song. That is one of those songs where it's really kind of hard not to bounce a little bit too. Maybe, you know, snap your fingers, I don't know. Um, it does kind of lift your spirits because God has done great things for us, and, and therefore we should be glad. So, like Amanda says, she hopes it sticks in your mind for the rest of this week. It's kind of like one of those rescue songs. You just maybe forgot the title of it, but it's just there, you know. Um, you can thank us for that next week. Let me see. You know, there's one, several people in the Bible who come to because God has made them glad, but uh, there's one specifically this morning. You got something for us, Dad? You're glad? Very good. Well, she's glad too, and I'm glad for her. There's several people in the Bible who God made glad, Jesus made glad through his actions. For one this morning, we're going to talk about in particular, and I found in John chapter 9, and I titled the sermon this morning, The Light in the Darkness. Um, so as we turn in there, if you're not already in the Bible, we wanted to share this joke, kind of to emphasize something we want to consider this morning. In the title, the joke is, Where's the Ball? Right, if you've played golf before, you understand that question sometimes. Where's that ball gone to? It says, How was your golf game here? asked Jack, Jack's wife, Tracy. Well, I was hitting pretty well, but my eyesight has gotten so bad, I couldn't see where the ball went. But you're 75 years old, Jack, admonished his wife. Why don't you take my brother Scott along? But he's 85 and doesn't even play golf anymore, protested Jack. But he's got a perfect eyesight, said Tracy. He can watch your ball, she pointed out. So the next day, Jack teed off with Scott looking on. And Jack swung, and, and the ball disappeared down the middle of the fairway. And, and he said, do you see it, asked Jack. Yup, Scott answered. Well, where is it, yelled Jack, peering off in the distance, and Scott kind of said, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that never happens, John, right? You never know. Yeah, I'm playing golf. See, one of the hardest things to lose is, one of the hardest things to lose in life is one of your five senses. You can think about it, you know, our five senses really help us to interact with everything around us, and no one really likes to realize or even to admit that maybe, for instance, they can't hear as they once did. Nor do they want to even think about or even admit that they cannot see as well as they did when they were younger. I don't like to admit that, but it's true. Still, for others, it can be a catastrophe when you think about it to lose maybe your hearing or your sight or one of your other senses to a tragic accident. Like the other day, I was speaking to a man who said that his father lost his eye to, to a, 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 something where his, his father, his grandfather, was doing some work around the house, and a piece of rock hit his father in the eye as a young man and put his eye out. So he lost his vision. And that's thing, that is tragic. People have a hard time with that. You would say, well, why? Well, simple. It's because we rely on those things so very much. Now, I've told the story before of staying in a friend's house, and this friend's house, it was his parents' house, and we had met, and we were staying, here and do some fishing the next day, I believe it was. And uh, we were staying at this ha house, and they put me up in a room that had no windows in it. It was a theater room in the bottom of their house, and so there was no windows, no ambient light whatsoever when they turn the lights off. And I promise you, when you're in a room with no windows, no ambient light, and the light goes off, it is really dark. You can't see anything. It's pitch black. And if you've ever been in that situation like that, then you know it's really hard to walk around in a totally dark environment. You see, Jesus talks about, in our text for today, spiritual darkness, though, that we all have because of our sin nature. He talks about a darkness that is so prevalent in our world, and how in our very nature as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and that's what we all are, if you're a human being, you're a son or daughter of Adam and Eve, how because of our very nature, we can't see through this darkness on our own. It's like we're standing in a room full of things, some are more helpful, some of them are harmful, but because of our condition, we can't see to walk around and we don't know which ones we'll bump into. So we need a light, don't we? And Jesus, at the Festival of Shelters, that was back in John 8, if you remember that, Jesus at the Festival of Shelters, he says this about himself, he says, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Today we're going to talk a little about this light of life. So please stand with me. We're just going to read the first seven verses of John 9 and just kind of give us an intro 
of the story as we learn about the man who's been healed from being blind. Verse 1, as he passed, this is Jesus, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming and when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpreted to mean sins. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. And the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? In verse 9, some said, It is he. And others said, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. Thank you, maybe seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Lord, we thank you for this simple story of a man who was made whole in the presence of Jesus. And Father, Jesus makes several important statements here about being the light, the light of darkness, the light of the world. And Father, we live in a very dark world right now where more of that light seems to be closing down, shutting, being shut off by so many things out there, Father. But we know your word that the light will always prevail as long as it's in the world. And we just have the eyes to see it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, give us today the eyes to see these things. Give us the eyes today to see what you're trying to tell us here in this scripture passage for today, Lord, as we consider this man who's made whole. And I pray for me to just transform our lives in some way. Help me, Father, to remove myself from this. It's, it's all about you, Father. I pray that you will take control of this message, Father, and just you speak and help me to speak the words that you want me to say, Father. And, and, your, and your Bible says that your word will not come back void. And I, I pray that it will not, but that it will accomplish that which you want it to do. Remove, I pray, any obstacles from our worship to be here this morning. And may we truly worship you, Lord, as you desire. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we see something very simple today, right? Jesus sees a blind man, and he gives him sight. But there's something else that happens. This blind man who is given sight then is interrogated because of this miracle. So there's really two points today that I'm going to look at. Number one is the miracle. There's something that happens in our story. Jesus does something that's miraculous, but then we're going to look at the interrogation that comes afterwards. So let's consider again the verses that we just read in verses 1 through 7. Jesus, as he is passing by, the Bible doesn't say where he's passing by at. It says as he's walking by, as he's passing by, he sees a blind man who's been blind from his birth. So John is telling us this man has been blind all of his life. And his disciples look at Jesus and ask him a very important question. They say this, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, you know, sometimes in life we're asked off the wall questions, aren't we? And you want to say, where in the world did that come from? These disciples, they, they ask a question that's kind of off the wall, and it just shows that they lack a sense of understanding here about how God operates in our world. The disciples think that this man is being punished by being blind for something that he's done, or maybe just maybe his parents have done. But what answer does Jesus give them? He says this, that this has come about so that God's glory can be made known. Think about that. This has come about so that God's glory may be made known. So what that tells me is that there's many, many things that can happen in our life. And we all have been through a lot of messy stuff in our lives. There are things that happen. And we sometimes say, I have no idea why that happened. What is the reason for it, right? What does God say here? Everything really happens for a reason. And ultimately, it may just be that God somehow uses that to glorify himself. And that's important to consider in our day and time because we all, whether we want to admit it or not, right, only have so much, on the, so much time on this earth. We all only have so much time on this earth. There will be a day where that time card is punched and our time is up. A time for God to do things in our 
our lives to point us to him. We have our limited amount of time in which God will work with us. That's what Jesus means in verses 45. He says this, we must work the words of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. So as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I promise you that when I had my surgery, it was not a walk in the park. I sent some pictures with the surgeon. The, the nurse was nice enough to try to get me distracted. You want me to take pictures of your eye? Well, sure. You know, I've got nothing else to do for two hours. Take a picture of it so I can send people. It hurt, right? I was trying to be distracted there. And, and when I got done with the surgery, both of my eyes hurt. You know, have you ever been there where you have sympathy pains? Man, have you ever been there when your wife is suffering through something and you have a sympathy pain for her? You know, whether you're suffering with her or suffering because of her, I don't know, you have a sympathy pain. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and, men, and women, you suffer because of men, too, right? He's suffering, either you're suffering because of him or with him. So it goes both ways. But you know what I'm talking about. And then when I got out of my surgery, this eye hurt so bad, and my sinuses hurt so bad because it's right next to it, and just like this eye said, I can't be left out, it was hurting, too. So Kimberly was leading me around and I'm going like this. I can't find where I'm going. I couldn't bear over my eyes, but they would just start wandering like crazy. Either way that I went, things hurt. That was day one. The doctor said tomorrow's going to be worse. I said, it can't be much worse than this, right? <laughs> but day two was far better than the first. And you say, well, why was day two better? Well, simply this is because of the difference a little medicine and a little time made. In my eyes. You see, Jesus, he makes a big difference when you get in time. And Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, the truth presented here that Jesus states is, is rather simple. It really is. It's rather simple. Jesus says this. He goes, I'm going to be around forever. I'm not going to be here forever. Jesus knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that he was going to die and that he'd be resurrected and go back to heaven. And he knew that his time would be limited. But then we learned in the book of Acts that, and even Jesus said to himself, that a helper was coming. So we learned in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit was coming, and Jesus said, he's going to teach you more because you're not able to bear it now. He's going to teach you more. And that this Spirit comes upon us as salvation. So if you read through the books of Acts, you see several times where an individual will get saved and baptized, or sometimes not exactly in that order, but they get saved, and the Spirit comes upon that individual, and they are, they are endowed with something from God on high. And the Bible says every believer has that. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? And this Spirit then acts as a seal, a lock, which never allows us to be lost again. He also lets you know that you're saved. And if you have a doubt about your salvation, you can look and think about yourself. You think about yourself introspectively, and you can see where God has worked in your life, where the Holy Spirit has worked in your life, and you can say, hey, I feel evidences of salvation through that. But there is an event that's going to happen sometime soon, I believe sooner than later. And it's found in the book of Revelation, and it's called the rapture. Are you familiar with the rapture? In the rapture, it's where Jesus returns, not to earth with, to put his feet on the earth. He returns in the sky, and he calls, and what happens is basically that the church is called up out of the earth to meet Jesus in the air. And when Jesus, he calls, and we as believers rise up to him to meet him in the air, guess who is it going to be left behind? The Holy Spirit. So when Jesus calls the church out of this world, the Holy Spirit goes with them. And then darkness comes. Now you can say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, here's the proof text for this. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. What is lawlessness? Well, that's evil. That's the translation of lawlessness in the, in, in the Bible. And he who restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. Have you ever been outside at night and you've got a flashlight and a battery truck's going dead? What happens? <laughs> you can't see as good, can you? When that battery goes completely dead, which is really pretty quick, you can't see at all. You're in darkness. And it's not pleasant because you can't see anything around you. Jesus says that he is the light 
He is the one that cuts through this darkness, allowing you to see clearly, but you'll only be able to take hold of this light for only so long. Why? Because he was going back to heaven, and one day in the rapture, so is the Holy Spirit. And the light's gone. We only have so long to take hold of what God is offering before it's gone. Which then leads to point number two, the interrogation. You see, this man was given sight. Jesus spit in the dirt and made some mud and put it on this man's eyes and told him to go wash his face off in this pool. So to get this image, here's a man who's walking through the streets with mud in his eyes. And people are probably wondering, what? What's going on with him? And then he's healed. And so, you know, if you've ever wondered about, man, that, that, that's a miracle. What would that be like? Well, I'll tell you what it was like in his day. He was interrogated. If you've ever watched any show about the police in the court, you know what that's like, right? You've seen those scenes where they pull him into an interrogation room. And you, and you know what that's like. It's, it's kind of like how this joke goes. The joke says, what's the difference between a classroom and an interrogation room? They will know the answer. In one, your questions are answered, while in the other, your answers are questioned. Right? That's how interrogations work. You know, what do you mean by that? You know, good cop, bad cop. What we see next in John's gospel is three different interrogations of this man who was healed so that he could see. And I want you to know something important in this. As you read through chapter 9, I'm not going to read the entirety of chapter 9 today because that's what it's all about, is this man being healed. But as you read through that, Jesus is nowhere present with this man physically. He's by himself. And the religious leaders of this day are trying to discredit him. In fact, in verse 8 through 12, the neighbors are looking at this man and they're filled with astonishment at the change that has been wrought in this man's life. And so they take him to these religious leaders. And the religious leaders say what? They, they begin to question him. Look at verses 13 through 17 with me. This is, what, this is what happens. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day. That's why they brought him to the Pharisees. When Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And so the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? What do you think about this man is what they're asking him. And he says this, he's got to be a prophet. You see, the Pharisees were, were the ones who were the legalistic ones of the society of that day. You know, they were all tied up in these man-made regulations. They felt that not only must you keep the Ten Commandments, you had to keep the Ten Commandments to be righteous with God. They had also put in these, all these other rules and regulations that they had come up with themselves just to keep you from even getting close to the Ten Commandments and breaking one. For instance, a man can do nothing on the Sabbath day other than prepare some food for eating. And someone couldn't be healed on the Sabbath day. It'd be like Jesus showing up in church today because it's Sunday and coming up to Mr. Lewis and saying, Mr. Lewis, I can take care of all your problems today. And someone would say, oh, no, 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 you can't because it's Sunday. We would say today, that's ridiculous, wouldn't we? Back then they would say, that can't happen because he's breaking the Sabbath. Because Sunday was supposed to be a day of rest, right? Jesus, in his death and resurrection, provides a rest for us. That's what the Bible says. He provides a rest for us. And the author of the book of Hebrews says that Jesus provides a spiritual rest for his people when they place their faith in him. And that is found in salvation. So when you are saved, you have a rest from that which is to come. So when the Bible is talking about rest on the Sabbath, well, yes, it is talking about a physical rest, but it's a physical rest that points to a spiritual rest. So having a day off is a good thing, right? We enjoy our Saturdays off. We enjoy our Sundays off. We are supposed to rest and rejuvenate ourselves. But part of that rest is also spiritual. That's why we're here on Sundays, right? The picture that Jesus gives of rest is a rest that can be found only in Him. So back to our scripture for today. Jesus could walk around and he could talk to people. He could gather a crowd of people around him on the Sabbath day. But heaven forbid that he heal someone. 
Why? Because they were missing half the picture. They would say he nor they were resting, missing the point completely that he was giving them a spiritual rest. But like we've discussed before, Jesus' miracles of healing simply pointed to a future healing, right? That's found in the Bible. That's found in the future through salvation. Understand, that's not what this interrogation is all about. It was about how they knew that a miracle had occurred, these Pharisees, one that they couldn't account for, and they one that they didn't like because to them, Jesus had broken the Sabbath. So what were they to do? Why was this such a dilemma for them? You know, they asked the man who was healed what he thought about Jesus. That's what they thought. They would say, well, maybe he'll give an answer that would kind of discredit Jesus in some way. They was hoping that he would help them out in their endeavors to somehow look against Jesus. But what did he say? He said, he's a prophet. He said that there is something unique about this man. You know, a man in the same this morning, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice because he has made me glad. Why has Jesus made you glad? Because of his salvation, because of there is something that's different about him. And it's true because he's the son of God. Interrogation number two is this. This is found in verses 18 through 23. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind. Until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight, and they asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, that how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. I'm going to stop there because that's a good spot to stop here for this reason. This man is not going to give them what they want. He's not going to give the Pharisees what they want. And they are not going to receive the answers that they want from him. So what are they going to do next? Well, our text says what they do next is that they're going to try to discredit him. And we see that all the time in the world, don't we? We see that all the time in TV. If a person will not give what they want, if they're not give someone else what they want, if they don't get the answers that they desire, and we instead listen to the flesh, and we can see that. We say, oh man, that guy on that TV show, he's listening to the flesh. He's not getting what he wants. And he's not listening to what God desires for them. What do we typically see happen? We see that person try to discredit the other person. They tell lies about them. They'll say different things about them. They'll try to take away whatever integrity that they have. For instance, if, you, if a professor or a teacher, you now you've been in high school before, if a teacher gives you a bad grade and the mom or dad says, now son or daughter, why did you get a D in this class? What is typically the answer? Well, they were just a bad teacher, right? They weren't good at what they were doing. Or maybe, maybe it's your company you work for. If you get reprimanded in some way for your company and we come home, what is typically the response? Well, they are a bad company because of whatever. We never, we have a hard time admitting we're wrong, don't we? We place the blame somewhere else. We attempt to discredit them in some way. It's, it's no different here in our scripture text. This man doesn't give them the answer that they want, so they attempt to discredit him by the miracle that he received. And you can say, well, how is that so? Well, they call his mom and dad. He was still young enough to have his mom and dad alive. So his mom and dad show up on the scene, and they ask him, is this your son? Was he born blind? And they said, yes, this is our son. He was born blind. You see, if he really wasn't blind from birth, maybe they could get away by saying, well, Jesus didn't really make him able to see. You see what they're trying to do there? Maybe, just maybe, the miracle never occurred. That his parents say, yes, this is our son, and yes, he was born blind. But no, we don't know how he's been able to make, he's been able to make see. And then they do something that's really interesting. They say, he's old enough, ask him. <laughs> he's old enough, ask him. That is blame shifting right there. He is old enough, ask him. And why do they say that? Because verse 22 is a nice little editorial comment by John. That's why it's in parentheses as it is. John says, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess to Jesus, 
to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. They were living in fear of confessing Christ. They may have believed him, but they couldn't confess him. Why? Because they'd be shunned. They would be kicked out of their own religious worship services there. In those days and at that time, public faith in Jesus had serious consequences. And they feared the consequences. And you know, I feel like we're getting down that road today ourselves more and more all the time. That we fear the consequences of telling people that we are believers in Christ. Christians, when they stand up for what you be they believe, they're being shot down. You know, what once was the majority is quickly becoming the minority. I read once of a Christian woman who was part of a neighborhood watch in her area, and they communicated with each other through like a, some sort of an email forum. I'm not sure how a lot of works out, but they could send emails to one another or talk about issues in the neighborhood and such. And so that one day this forum, in this forum, they were discussing something that was completely unethical by Christian standards. And so this woman, this Christian woman, voiced her concerns because of her faith. And she said she was stunned because someone sent her a message back and said, you just need to keep your mouth shut. There's no room for what you think. That her opinion did not matter. In a culture that quickly tells you anything goes, and that's right, that's what you see out there, anything goes, right? You can do anything you want. There is no moral absolutes. Well, guess what really doesn't go? Christianity doesn't, right? Amen. Your faith doesn't. What the Bible says doesn't. This then leads to the third interrogation that we see in the Bible today. This found in verses 24 through 40, 34, and I'm not going to read those here. And you can read if you want to, but, but I want you to look at them later, or even now if you want, because these Pharisees, they're really stuck, right? They can't discredit the miracle. They can't discredit him. And yet if they acknowledge God, if they acknowledge that Jesus has done something and that Jesus is from God, what does that mean for them? Well, if Jesus is God, then what he's saying about us must be true. Ouch. Right? Ouch. It's like Bodhi Malcolm says, you know, if you're listening to a sermon, you should have only two responses, amen or ouch. They don't want to hear the ouch. What he says must be true, and they really are spiritual hypocrites. Do you know why people do not want to acknowledge the Bible today? Because if they do, the same will be true proven about them, and they don't want that. They don't want to admit to the ouch that comes in reading God's Word. So what do these Pharisees do? Well, they attempt to discredit him again. Look at what they say in verse 24. Give glory to God. And that's another way of saying as God is your witness, right? You stand in a court and you are to put your hand on the Bible and you are to make an oath that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This is what they're doing here. You tell the truth. And that truth is Jesus is a sinner, isn't he? Right? That's what they want him to say. But you see, that's the power of sin. Because sin distorts the mind. Sin makes it impossible to see things clearly. You think about things today that our culture deals with. I'll use pornography for an example. If you read anything that talks about addiction to pornography, if you talk to any counselors who counsel men and young men and even, and even women who deal with pornography, what they say right up front is that once you start, it's real hard to stop. And why? Because the more you do it, the more you think it's okay. Sin distorts the mind. The same goes with your thoughts. You know, if, for instance, and if for some reason you were convinced as a child that the grass really is purple and it's not green outside, all your life you've grown up, that's not really green, that's purple. I just can't see it, but it's purple. Right? And then someone comes to you later in life and says, no, the grass is really green. What are you going to say? How likely are you to agree with them that the grass is green? Not likely. Because that thought has been rooted in your mind for so long that you believe it to be the truth. Sin blinds you so that you cannot see. So how does this man answer them? Look at verse 25. He answers, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's a great testimony. 
Look at this. This man who had no prior knowledge that Jesus was the one who healed him, he said what? He goes, I don't know anything about him other than he made me see. I see his actions, right? As evidence of who he is. Now, now, I won't read the rest of the dialogue there. You can read it entirely for yourself if you want to. But I want you to look at verses 30 through 34. The man answered, Wow, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And then they kicked him out. You see, having even the limited knowledge that this man had, he knew that Jesus had to be from God because of the miracle. And Jesus finds him later in the, in the crowds, and, and he says essentially this, Have you placed your faith in the Son of God who became a man? Do you recognize your need of a Savior, and are you willing to turn from your own attempts and trust in Him alone to save you? If you read it in the Bible, that's basically what Jesus is saying to this man. Jesus doesn't tell him when he asks, who is this man? Jesus doesn't say, oh, he's over there, go speak to him there, or he's down the road in that shop or whatever. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you've seen him. The man who was blind has been made able to see him. Who does he see? First thing, he sees Jesus. You've seen him. The very important two ways that this can apply to us today. Number one, before you can see Jesus, you first have to admit that you're blind. Jesus said in Mark 2, 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You see, one of the problems the world faces today is self-righteousness. The belief that I've got everything I need, I am good enough. Or one that is even more scary. That I can come to God however I want. There was all these roads that lead to heaven. I can choose whichever one I want, right? Wrong. Because this is what Matthew says. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. There are many going to hell today who have no clue that they are. And that's a sad reality. Number two, if we want more of Christ, we must recognize a growing need for Him. Those who drink the most are the, are the ones who are the thirstiest, right? Those who eat the most are the ones who feel the hungriest. Those who see and enjoy the, and experience the most are the ones who flee the darkness and run to the light. I can summarize this in one sentence. To get more of Christ, you've got to really want more of Him. I went in today with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. I like Spurgeon. He says a, a lot of good things. And what he says today is fitting. This is what he says. It is not our littleness that hinders Christ, but our bigness. It is not our weakness that hinders Christ. It is our strength. It is not our darkness that hinders Christ. It is our supposed light that holds, his, holds Him back. What's holding back his hand from those you know who are walking in darkness? What is holding those back from the ones you love who are walking in darkness? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. There is none other. What is holding you back? I think about good to close your eyes with me as we go into a time of invitation and prayer. Father, Jesus is clear. I am the light of the world. And I'm only going to be here for a while. There is no other light that will lead to salvation, to eternity. There is a narrow gate we are entering in by, and it's difficult because it's only one way. And we balk at that. We don't want that one way. We want our way. Our neighbors and our relatives, they want their way. And Jesus says, I am the only way. Perhaps while there was someone here today who's been trying to enter in at the wide gate and they realize that they cannot. That they 
head into destruction, to hell. And, and that is an unpopular thing to talk about, to even think about, but it's a necessity because if I don't answer the questions and you wait until God answers the questions and you wait waited too long. You stand before God Almighty and say, He asked, Why should I let you in heaven? And you don't have an answer, you're not getting in. There is no owner friend. There is no, let me think about it for a little bit. You give an answer, you don't. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the light. And I pray if someone's here that doesn't have that light today, they, they can find it in him. And I'll be glad to show them. But maybe someone has walked with that light and they've set it down. You know, Jesus doesn't leave us or forsake us. We are the ones who walk away from him. And if I see you today, for whatever that may be, I, I pray, Lord, that you will draw them back to you. Help them to pick that light back up and to, to let allow it to shine in their path freely. To show them that the dangers that are there and the things that they need to be aware of. And Lord, I pray also that through this, Lord, you'll be honored and glorified because this is the time between you and them. Please do your work, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.